Hi everyone, this is Sound and Voltage, and today I want to look at the Turing machine. It would be hard to find a more iconic module in the world of Eurorack. It's been around for about 10 years now, and it's still one of the mainstays for starting to explore generative music. And especially if you're interested in DIYing your own modules, building your own Turing machine is practically a rite of passage. I built my own, and then I built all the expanders, and then I put it behind a custom panel by Magpie. Then even five years later, it's the centerpiece of my setup. And part of what I find really exciting about Turing Machine is that it isn't based on software. There's no microcontroller in there. It manages everything with just a few basic ICs and some cleverness. And with just that, it can form the hub of a whole patch. It does have its limits, though. And when I started using the Monome Teletype as a way of creating generative music, it was natural that I'd want to recreate the Turing machine on it. So I set out to understand how it works. It took a bit of patience, and a lot of staring at the Mordax Data's voltage monitor to figure it out, but eventually I cracked the code. Now I am doing a series of videos about programming the Teletype, and I wanted the next one to be about how to recreate the Turing machine algorithm, and then expand on it. But as I was preparing that video, I realized that it's not just teletype users who might be interested in understanding more about the Turing machine. So I thought I'd do them as separate videos. This one's going to go deep on how the Turing machine works, and then there will be a second video that describes programming it on the teletype. So in this video, I'm not going to linger too long on how to use the Turing machine. There's plenty of videos about that. I'll start with a quick review, but I really want to dig in on how it works. If you find the diagrams helpful, they're going to be available online at the URL below and in the video description. But yeah, before I get into the details of how it does thing, let's review what it does. For my demos with this, I'm using my full Turing machine with the expanders that are mounted behind the Magpie modular panel. But the video is only going to touch on the core unit. If you'd like a separate video on the expanders, leave a comment on the video and let me know. So the basic functionality is pretty simple. You feed it a clock signal, and all the LEDs start advancing down the line. I've got the pattern length here set to eight steps, and you can see that when the single lit LED gets to the end, it wraps back around. For the purposes of this video, I want you to think in terms of advance and set. As the pattern moves around, first everything advances, and then the very last cell wraps around to become the first one. The set part happens so quickly that you don't notice the difference, but it's going to be useful to think about it this way. So now I'm running the output of the Turing machine into the Mordax data, and you can see what's happening. As the LED advances down the row, the voltage gets bigger. It starts out with small steps, and by the end of the row it's taking really big leaps. In fact, each step is double the previous one, and we're going to talk about that when we get to the topic of output voltage. So let's get that CV plugged into an oscillator and give it a listen. Yikes! That's not the most musical sound ever. And those huge jumps in voltage are definitely evident here. And that's what the scale control is for. It reduces the maximum voltage that can be generated and scales everything to match. That's easier on the ears, but you can definitely tell it's out of tune. So let's run that CV through a quantizer first on its way to the oscillator. That's better, but still a little uneven though, so I'm going to use a clock to control when the quantizer can change, and we might as well get the oscillator voice using the same clock for proper notes. You can hear that it's just playing the same note for the first several steps. And that's because the Turing machine is outputting less voltage than is needed to move up a full note. That will change though as we add a few more lit LEDs by pressing the right switch up. When the switch is up, it ignores the wraparound and instead forces that LED to be on every time it advances. And if the switch is pushed down, then the LED will be turned off on each step.
You can manually turn that first step on and off, but when you dial the probability back towards the middle range, that's when the Turing machine is going to randomly flip some of the LED states as it advances, so the pattern will continuously evolve. Okay, so that's what the Turing machine does. Let's get into the meat of it. And that comes down to these, shift registers. Shift registers are essentially a form of short-term, delayed memory. They effectively remember a series of high and low voltages, which we just treat as zeros and ones. Shift registers have two inputs. There's a data input that takes either the zero or the one, and then there's a clock signal that tells it when to take in that next value. So let's say you've got a high voltage, a one, waiting at the data input. When the clock ticks, that one is gonna be written into the first cell of the shift register. Then the input changes and now there's a zero waiting. Another clock tick and the previous value is shifted down one cell to make room and the zero is written in. At the next clock tick, the data input is still low, so another zero is written into the register after everything has been shifted down one. Another clock tick, and this time there's a one waiting. Everything is shifted down, and that one is written in. Now this register only has four cells, or stages, so when that next clock tick happens, everything gets shifted down one, but that means that last value in the register, the very first one that we put in, has nowhere to go, and it sort of falls out the end. That leaves a zero as the last element in the register. When the clock ticks again, that zero is pushed out. If we were just making a simple binary delay, then we would just send that value out to the rest of the circuit. But in this case, the IC that the Turing machine uses actually has two of these four-stage shift registers per chip. So maybe we can just wire the end of one to the start of the other. And that's exactly what we do. We wire the output of the first into the data input of the second, and then we use the same clock signal for both. Coming back to advance and set again, each of these registers does it individually. First, all of the elements are pushed down, and then the first cells are written based on what's on the data lines. So now we have a delayed memory going back eight steps. Cool. But we still have the problem where when the data gets to the end of the register, it falls out the other side. So what if we were to take the output value of the second register and just use that as the input for the first? That way, whatever falls out of the end is going to be put back in at the start, and we just repeat that process. And just like that, we have an eight-step pattern that runs in a loop, continuously rotating the bits down the stages and then wrapping them back around. This is probably starting to look familiar. A quick aside at this point, I'm using eight steps as my pattern length on the Turing machine because it makes it clear what's happening. But in fact, the Turing machine uses four of these shift registers to allow up to 16 steps in the pattern. Only the first eight count as far as generating output and showing the state on the LEDs, so for my exploration, I'm going to stick to the eight-stage example. Also, this is a good time to remind you about that pulse output. It just looks at the first stage of the shift register and sends it out. If the first cell is going to be a one, then it sends out a pulse. If it's going to be a zero, it doesn't. So far, we've just grabbed the value that comes out of the register and feeds it back in at the front without changing it. Of course, we don't have to just repeat it. The Turing machine will let you set the bits manually. That's what the right switch on the front panel does. When you push it upwards, it tells the Turing machine to ignore whatever comes out of the register and instead push a one onto the data input. If the switch is down, it pushes a zero onto the data input. And when you let the switch go and it moves back to the middle position, then it just comes back to the old repeating behavior. The switch position decides which of the three values to write into the shift register, zero, one, or whatever came out of the other side of the register. One change we could make is we could flip the bit between when it comes out and when it's fed back in. So if there's a zero that comes out the other end, we'd put a one in at the front and vice versa. And if we let that run, it'll definitely change things up, but pretty soon you'll notice it still repeats. For the first eight steps, it flips all the bits, and then for the next eight steps, it flips them all back again. That's still pretty cool, and I'm gonna come back to that in a second, but it is still a fixed pattern, and we want something that evolves over time. So maybe as it comes out of the register on the end, we split the path in two. One path keeps the value the same as it was, the other inverts it. So now we always have a one and a zero waiting. We just have to choose which one we want to take. If we tell it to always take the non-inverted path, then we just repeat the pattern over and over again. 
If we tell it to take the inverted version every time, then we get that behavior we just saw where it runs the pattern, then runs it inverted, and then repeats, effectively doubling the length of the pattern. Setting it at a 50-50 is going to effectively randomize things as it changes roughly half the pattern on every pass. And that should probably sound pretty familiar because it's exactly what the Turing machine does. Now the way randomness works here is pretty interesting. There's a noise generating circuit inside the Turing machine and on each clock tick it samples the noise and compares it with the value that the probability knob is dialed to. Whether or not the noise voltage exceeds the value of the knob decides whether or not it's going to invert the value. And this way we get a noise output on the Turing machine as well. Bonus! I have to admit that I never really understood fully how it achieved that double length trick. And I only figured it out as I was making this video. I poured over the schematics trying to figure out what component it was that was allowing 32 steps to fit into shift registers that it could only hold 16. But it isn't any specific IC or anything. Instead, it's just a side effect of flipping every bit before it's fed back into the register. That Tom guy is pretty clever. Okay, so now we know how the pattern gets built up in the shift registers. All we need now is to turn that pattern into voltage for output. The short answer is pretty easy. The first eight stages of the shift register are sent into a digital to analog converter, and Bob's your uncle, there's some voltage. But that's not a very useful answer if we want to recreate it on the teletype, so let's dive into that a bit. When we look back at the intro video, when I showed the oscilloscope trace as a single LED moved across the pattern, you could see that the voltage doubled at each step. And it actually makes more sense to sort of think about it in reverse, that there's some reference voltage that gets cut in half and then cut in half again and then cut in half again. And there's a circuit to do that, it's called a voltage ladder. And if we were to crack open the digital to analog converter, this is exactly what we'd see. The first eight stages are the on-off inputs into the digital to analog converter, and it adds up all of the subdivided voltages for the inputs that are high, and that's what's output. I find that when I have all eight cells lit up, I get a maximum output from the Turing machine of about 8.4 volts. So the first divider gives me 4.2 volts, the second 2.1, the third a little bit more than one volt, the fourth half a volt, and so on. But there's another way to think of it, and if you're a software person at all, the idea of having something over and over again, or rather doubling something over and over again, probably sounds a lot like binary digits and the eight LEDs start to look like an 8-bit value. The largest value that can be represented with 8 bits is 255. So let's divide that 8.4 volts by 255 and you get 0.033 volts or 33 millivolts. If we take that value as the base unit of voltage to work with, we can actually calculate the exact voltage output by multiplying the 8-bit number that the LEDs represent by that unit voltage. So let's bring back that single LED moving across the pattern. When it's that first LED on the far right, we can interpret that as the value one. So we'd expect to see that unit voltage, 33 millivolts, and on the voltage monitor, that's what we see, 0.03. Advance the pattern, and now the LEDs represent the number 2, so we'd expect to see 0.06 volts. And there it is. Another step, the LEDs read a value of 4, so we'd expect 33 millivolts times 4, or 0.13 volts, and there it is. And it continues. 0 0.26, 0 0.52, 1.05, 2.11 and finally 4.22, doubling each time. Now this is just a single bit, and if we had more than one LED lit, we'd be adding those values together. And as you would expect, if I turn on all of the LEDs, we add it together, all of those values I just listed, and it comes out right at 8.4 volts. But of course, especially if you're using the output as pitch CV, 8.4 volts is a lot. It's not often that you want something that spans eight octaves. And that's why the scale attenuator on the front panel is important. I don't think that in real usage I ever have it set much above the halfway point of even that. And that about wraps up our tour of the inner workings of the Turing machine. First we looked at how shift registers work and how you can create a repeating sequence. Then how you can manually set bits on and off. Then we inverted all of the bits to create a double length sequence. 
and added in a random component to flip the bits based on where the probability dial is turned. And we wrapped up with how that pattern gets turned into output voltage. The Turing machine is pretty cool, but it's actually pretty simple when you see it broken down this way. And in the next teletype video where we start to code this up, you're going to see that it actually comes together really simply. It doesn't take much code at all to generate this. Until then, though, thanks for watching. If you made it this far, maybe consider subscribing. Thanks.